Praise the Lord, everyone. Glad to see you back with us again. We hope that all is well with you. We pray that things are going the way that you would like for them to be. And you know, we are having our walk in the Word, but I thought about some things this morning, just for a minute I'd like to share with you. I was thinking about the Word that we are so grateful for, we're so blessed to have it. This Word that God has given us, it's like a love story a love letter that he has given us that we can read and pull in things that we need to help us along our way. We have occasion to talk to people after the broadcast uh, and throughout the week, and we find that people are really going through some tough times. Not only the things that happen uh, in their households regarding jobs and uh, lack of finances and so forth, but they're having a lot of emotional challenges too. The kind of anxiety and stress that's been imposed on them because of the situation we find ourselves in in this world. And I just want to say, let's be intentional about reaching out to people because even the most devoted, prayerful people that we know can have those valley moments where things come up that they hadn't expected and can put them into a state of depression or just a state of doubt. And we know the enemy can come along at those times telling you things that you're not doing well, you're not going to get well, you're not doing right, things are going to go worse instead of better. But we need to know that sometimes there's someone who's going to reach out to us. We may be able to pray for others and lift them up. Sometimes it's harder to do it for ourselves. We find ourselves doubting. We find ourselves in a place where we hadn't expected to be and it can come on suddenly. So let's be intentional about reaching out to our, not just our family and our friends, but our neighbors and those. Sometimes we can speak a word into someone's life that we meet in the grocery store line that will make a difference. How we live our lives impacts other people. Our children watch us. Do they see us one way on Sunday as we prepare to go to church and then not living well the rest of the week? We must be intentional about all things because they watch us. They learn from not what we say, but what we do. So let's be careful in all areas of our lives. Let's be impactful and intentional to help others to be the light that God wants us to be. And just a simple scripture that says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. That means everywhere we walk, every path that we take, he's there to guide, put that light on it, and help us through but we have to be intentional about reaching for him. So let's help somebody this week. Let's take a look at ourselves and be mindful of how we live. We are trying to live this life now in preparation for the one that is to come. So there is a lot that we must be accountable for and responsible for. God bless you. Thank you. Our Bible teacher, Elder Milton Andrew, is going to come and bring us a word. God, deliver me from me, part two. Thank you, and God bless you. Praise the Lord, my God. I, I certainly thank God for the, the power of words that this young lady has. She, uh, ooh, she I was sitting there mesmerized uh, by her power, by her calmness, and by the strength of her words. And you better believe you, me, that everything she's saying is from her heart. Praise the Lord, everybody giving God the glory. I can't show you all how pretty it is here in sunny St. Augustine, Florida, but trust you me, it is one beautiful day. I think we are about 75 degrees sunshine, and one day I'm going to take you guys out on our patio by the pool, and we're going to do something that's really pleasant to your eyes. But in the meantime, we're here in my kitchen giving God the glory. I want to say that next week is Thanksgiving Friday. I'm going to take a day off. I think this is the first time that I've escaped Friday at noontime since before March. But uh, we're going to take a day off. We plan to spend some time with our family in North Carolina. So you guys pray for us. I thank you, Kalisa Whitehead, for being on and your faithfulness. Portia Hewitt, I see you, my angel, the one that God sent to me 
to lead me out of darkness into the marvelous light. When I see your name, my heart just lights up. Cheryl Plenty, I miss you, girl. Uh, thank you for being so, 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 so patient and so, so true and faithful to us. Now, you know I'm going to move uh, these names because at this age, I can't read. Uh, my sister, Beulah Foster, loving you, girl. Miss you. You guys, uh, I hope to see you next month for Christmas. Praise the Lord once again. I'd like to quickly call your attention to uh, our uh, scripture reading coming from Romans, the seventh chapter, verse number 15. Uh, seven, verse number 15. And it reads like this. I'm going to read it out to King James. Last time I read it out the modern uh, version. So you all should be able to understand this time through the King James. In the scriptures for today, it reads as this. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man, that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Coming from verse number 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I like to use for a topic, a guiding thought, Lord, deliver me from me, part two. Lord, deliver me from me, part two. The, body, the, the Bible admonishes us by the mercies of God to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, which is our reasonable service. It says to be, to, to be don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good, what is that acceptable, what is that perfect will of God. Now, when you look at what God is asking us to do, me doesn't want to go through that process because it is a process. When we get saved, we're not perfect. We are perfectly saved, but we are progressively being sanctified. God is taking us from one point to another point. We ain't there yet, but each day, each year, we shall see that we are progressing to the mark, to the prize of the calling of God. So you see me, me is blocking the, the program. Me doesn't want to relinquish the, the, the power that, that, that is in me. God is spending time trying to make us independent, dependent on him. And me always want to be independent. Me want to do what me want to do when me wants to do it. But God is telling us, Milton, if you're going to make that mark, you're going to have to overcome three things. The first thing I told you guys last week that we have to overcome is the world itself. We are in the world, 
but we are not of the world. We are in the world because we live here, but our citizenship is in heaven. And the rules and the laws that we obey are the ones that come from heaven, the ones that come from God. That's why we have to gift ourselves to God. That's why we have to present ourselves to God. That's why we have to take on the mind of God and the thoughts of God that we're able to see, understand, and obey the heavenly standards and the rule of God. So the Bible said you got to overcome this world, this world standards, the system, how they get their blessings. It's not the way God wants us to live and to abide by. The second thing we have to overcome is Satan himself. Satan's mission is to steal, kill, and to destroy. Satan has said in his heart, man, if God takes the, the hedge from around Milton, I can get him to do anything. So Milton and the rest of the saints of God, sometimes we got to go through something and God allow us to go through something just to prove that we are who he have called us to be. He already knew it. So sometimes he shuts the devil up. He said, let this happen. And I declare Milton is going to stay on course. Milton is going to continue to lift me up. Milton is going to continue to praise my name. So sometimes, Things happen to us, but they happen to us by permission from God. Satan has no control over us. God is in control. And the last thing we have to overcome, the most difficult thing, is flesh. Flesh is me. We have to overcome ourselves, you all. My God, that is not an easy thing because what flesh want to do is opposite than what God want us to do. Flesh want to watch television 24-7. The spirit of God that's in us want us to pray, want us to consecrate, want us to fast. Flesh want to do everything that is contrary to the will of God. That's us, y'all. That's the person that we get up with that's the person that we walk with. That's the person that we go to bed with. It's us. That's our enemy. It has co-signed. It has partnered with Satan to take us to hell. What kind of talk is that? My flesh is an enemy to me getting where my soul want to go. So my brothers and sisters, we got to overcome flesh. And this is what we are speaking to today. Lord, show me, deliver me from me. So we look at, and we, we want to blame Satan, but flesh is, is, is built with the material that James says that when every man is tempted, he's tempted and drawn away by his own lusts. Lust is an excessive desire for something. It's all right to desire if you're a man, a woman. And it's all right if you're a woman to desire a man. It's all right if you're a family to desire a house. But when it becomes excessive, it means that you got to have this man regardless of what the word of God says. You're going to get this house in any way and any means because that desire in you has pushed you. And all of us have something in us that we had on the other side of Calvary that we have brought with us on this side of Calvary. But just like that forbidden tree that I told you guys about last uh, week, we can't touch it, we can't eat it, because the day that we touch it, the day that we eat it, the day that we listen to it, we shall die. So every man has a lust. I told you that I had one for that forbidden tree. My God, it was running me crazy. And I told God, I said, Lord, if you remove that tree, you find one good child of God one walking upright. That tree keep pulling me. That tree keep talking to me. That tree keep tempting me. And God said, Milton, he said, I will never move that tree. He said, if you love me, you're going to walk around it. If you love me, you won't touch it. If you love me, you won't even listen to it. So I said, Lord, 
I think I can do that. And I told you guys that tree, I, I really love that tree. But as close as I got to God, what happened is that I found out that I love God more than I love that tree. And I was able to walk around that tree because of my love for God. Love of anything compels you to give yourself to the person that you love. And I love God. I gave myself to God. I didn't have time for that tree. So James said, every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lusts and then enticed. This is when the devil comes in. He sees your desire. Then he become to come in to entice you. He come in to show you a reward if you will cross the word if you would transgress the law of God. He tells you, boy, don't you remember how good it was to, to lay in that lady's arms and to hold her hands and to kiss her and to make love to her? Oh man, here, I'm on the other side of Calvary now and he's bringing back these thoughts and these desires to my mind. If I do this, man, I can have both sides. I can be saved and I can be in, in, in my unregenerated state and do the things that I used to do. Satan is a liar. For the Bible tells us that, you know, the only church that made God see, sick was the church of Laodicea. That church was neither cold nor hot. It was lukewarm. And I don't know about you, my brothers and my sisters, but I like my cold stuff cold and I like my hot stuff hot. I like a soft drink to be cold. I like my coffee to be hot. If my soft drink is lukewarm, I, it doesn't do anything for me. If my coffee is lukewarm, it doesn't do anything for me. God is saying to us, he's saying, if you love me, you're going to be on fire for me. If you love me, you're going to be hot. He said, if you ain't hot, I don't want you. I spoo. He, he threw up. You made him sick. You made him vomit because you were lukewarm. A lukewarm saint is a saint that, as I just demonstrated, he feels that he can be with God on Sunday, but on Monday and Tuesday night, he got women's night at the club. On Thursday night, you got uh, jazz night. And on, on Friday and then on Saturday, you partying in at somebody's house. And then Sunday, you running in the church, putting on your robe to sing and give this holy God glory and praise. My brothers and sisters, God said, you're the kind of saint that makes him sick. So, so you cannot have both. You either, God said, you either on fire for me or you're not. You either have a right mind or your mind is going to become reprobated. And what a reprobated mind is, my brothers and sisters, is that right start looking wrong and wrong start looking right. That's how you have people continuing this cycle of going, partying, of fornicating and adult, committing adultery, of being homosexual, being gays, everything that's against the Bible. And they stand in that place in church and feel that they are all right. Their minds in Romans 1, I believe in 18, God said, because when you, when you, when you had me, when you, when you knew who I was, you believe the lie instead of the truth. And you begin to worship the creator, the creature more than the creator. And God said, look, I'm going to give you over. I'm giving you over to a reprobated mind. My brothers and sisters, if your mind is reprobated, there's no reason to repent. Because now fornication and adultery seem right. And nobody has to repent when you're doing right. So that's the trick of going out and sin. Going to 1 John 1 and 9 saying, Lord, I confess my sin, forgive me of my sin, and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. There come a time that God is going to say enough is enough. And if you want to be cold, you want to be lukewarm, he said, I'm going to give you a reprobated mind to be what your heart desire to be. So don't be going to hell through the church thinking that you got it all right when you're doing all wrong. So here's Satan enticing you. Telling you, man, don't you remember how it was when you got high on drugs? Man, it was nothing like it, my brothers and sisters. You knew that. You you remember that. So so why don't you just hit hit hit? 
get that crack thing again, man. Why don't you just smoke some more marijuana? Why don't you just drink some more alcohol? He gives you a reason. He reminds you of how it was when you were on the other side of the cross. And then when, 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 when he began to entice you, then you begin to move it from your head to your heart. And as a man, think it in his heart. When that thing is conceived, when that thought is in your heart, it is nothing nobody can do because you are what your heart is. And as a man thinking in his heart, so is he. So it says after that thing is conceived, then it bringeth forth sin. And after sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Now, you know, and I told you, and I think I need to stop here for a moment, that death is in three different definitions. The first death is physical death. All of us are going to die physically. The Bible says appointed to a man for a man to die once and after that, the judgment. All of us are going to die. Doesn't matter how much money you have, don't matter how holy you are, doesn't matter how, 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 whatever. You're going to leave here. Now, spiritual death is why you're living here. You did not get the spirit of Christ. The Bible says if you have not the spirit of Christ, you're none of his. So you, without the Holy Ghost, without being born again, are spiritually dead. Although you're breathing, although you, you're active, spiritually you're dead. Now, here's the one, and this is where Satan trying to delay us and keep us in foolishness, keep us worn in our members, keeping us not making the choice to give ourselves holy, not, 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 uh, W H, not H O L L Y, but W, well, not, not H O L Y, but W H O L L Y. Sometimes I need my wife. She pulled me right away. Give yourself holy to God. Give your whole self to God. He delays you there. So when you die spiritually dead, when you die physical, if you have not gotten the Holy Ghost, you are eternally dead, eternally separated from God forever. And one thing I like about God, and I don't want to get hung up in this point, but God has called us to serve him here and when we die, we are going to be with God. We're coming back for the battle of Armageddon. We're going to rule and, and, uh, and reign with him in the millennial period. But there's a period after the millennial period that's forever, y'all. The Bible don't even tell us what that's going to be. But it ain't just for a thousand years. It's forever. God is calling us to be a part of his team forever. And that means eons of time. And on the other end, you're going to be in this place called hell after the great white throne judgment forever. So my brothers and sisters, we have to win the war in our members. We got to keep praying, Lord, deliver me from me. The Bible tells us to make no provisions for the flesh. The flesh is a demon, you all. And I, I told you, you, you cannot drive your girl to the beach, play the soft music, and, and, and you know you have a problem in your flesh. You are making provisions for the flesh. Always have people around. Always have yourself where you're not giving the flesh an opportunity to come in and to take over. And then if you drink, you had a drinking problem on the other side of the cross, man, you still got that problem in your flesh. They say once an uh, alcoholic, always an alcoholic. So you don't go to parties where people are drinking. You don't go to parties where people are using drugs because you're making provisions for your flesh. And the Bible says those that walk after the flesh, they shall die. My God, why die? when you can live? Why go to hell when you can go to heaven? Why live in turmoil when you can live in peace? Lord, deliver me from me. I got the antidote today, and this is what I'm going to close on. The antidote is the Holy Ghost. 
In Romans, the seventh chapter, you're looking at a man trying to keep the law in his flesh. My brothers and sisters, you can't keep the law in your flesh. That's why Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh and died for us to take the power of sin, to take the power of the law that had us bound forever. In the Old Testament, my brothers and sisters, they couldn't keep the law. That's why they had so many sacrifices, turtle doves, lamb, everything. But these sacrifices pointed to Christ, the great sacrifice, the lambs and the turtle dove, the oxen, they only covered the sins of man for a season. But when Jesus came and died, he took sins away forever and he put them in the sea of forgetfulness. When God looks at us, he doesn't see sin. He doesn't see our shortcoming. He doesn't see that kind of war in our members. He see the righteousness of Christ on us. For he that knew no sin became sin. That you and I can escape, y'all, and become the righteousness of God. So when Jesus, glory be to God, came and died, and when he he, he, he took the sting away from death. He took the sting away. He gave us the victory, but he gave it to us through the spirit that he was promising the sin back to us. My brothers and sisters, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of promise. Jesus took the sting away. Yes, he did. He finished all of that work, but he said that, look, I go away, but I'm going to send the comforter back. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of promise. In Acts, in, in, in Joel 2 and 28, Joel said that in the latter days, I'm going to pour my spirit out upon all flesh. On the day of Pentecost, my brothers and sisters, when Jesus died, he sent back that spirit. And on that day in Acts, the, the second chapter, they were all on one accord and there appeared to me, uh, them uh, cloven tongues like as a fire set upon them and there was like a rushing mighty wind and they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. And then the, the people that came on that day, it's a feast day. People from all regions of Rome came to worship and they said, man, these people falling all over, speaking in our tongues, they must be drunk on new wine. And Peter stood up with the keys and said, look, they are not drunk as ye suppose. He fulfilled his promise that he made in Joel 2 and 28. He says, this is that, that the prophet Joel promised. He said that in the last days, I'm going to pour my spirit upon all flesh. And here you saw him do it. When those people were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues, you saw God fulfilling his promise. My God, glory be to God. He, he, he promised the disciples, say, look, when I go, I'm going to send a comfort back. Who is the Holy Ghost? He's going to testify of me. When I go, I'm going to send the comforter back. Who is the Holy Ghost? He is the spirit of truth. I, when I go, I'm going to send the comforter back, the Holy Ghost. And then you see uh, John in Matthew 3 and 11. He said that, look, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that coming after me, who is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not even worth the bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. My brothers and sisters, the Holy Ghost is the antidote to your flesh. The Holy Ghost is the power that Jesus uses to take away and deliver you from you. So my brothers and sisters, if you have not spoken in other tongues, I know I sound crazy to a whole lot of people, but I'm out of the word of God. If you have not spoken in other tongues, as the scripture has said, my brothers and sisters, you don't have the Holy Ghost. You have not been born again. I know you are morally pure. I know you go to church. I know you believe in God. But if you have not received Jesus 
as the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you have not received the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, he that has not the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost, that's all it is, a, a, a ghost is a spirit. That, that that was a part of a man when they, the man died, his ghost, that's the ghost that the people used to talk about in the country or the ghost of Uncle Jed and the ghost of Cousin Lou. That's the ghost. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of Christ. It's his spirit that he sent back to us. And look, it's important to know how he comes because I was I raised that my mama told me that they had to sit on a mourner's bench and they had to wait until something touched them in their head. Then they knew that they had received the Holy Ghost. My God, can you imagine your anxiety and being in the flesh, being unregenerated and just claiming something touched you? But God gave a clear sign. He said, when the Holy Ghost come, you're going to have evidence. You're going to speak in a language that you have not learned in school. Matthew 16 and 17, he that believe in and is baptized shall be saved. 16 and 15 and 17, in my name, they shall speak with new tongues. If you believe in God, you shall be, you should be speaking in new tongues. Glory be to God. It's all through the word. When Paul, when Peter went to uh, Cornelius house, the Gentiles, glory be to God. And you know, he was, he was leery, you know, they don't go to Gentiles. Gentiles was like a dog. They didn't go there, but God said, don't call nothing unclean that I've called clean. So he was there. And while Peter yet spake in Acts 10 and 44, the Holy Ghost fell upon the uncircumcision, the, the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, and, and, and how do you know? They said, for we heard them speak in other tongues. When Peter went to Ephesians and he saw John's disciples in Acts 19 chapter, he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? Right there, it dispels the fact that when you believe, you get the Holy Ghost. No, check the Sumerians. They believed the preaching of uh, Philip concerning uh, uh, a God and Jesus. And they were baptized, but they had not received the Holy Ghost. They had to send for John and, and send for uh, 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 Paul to come and to pray for them that they may receive the Holy Ghost. So here he's asking these disciples, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they say, we have not even heard of such a thing as the Holy Ghost. You're talking about 80% of the world of Christendom right now who, because people don't have the revelations, they have not even heard that they need the Holy Ghost and that he comes speaking in other tongues. They have not even heard it. They have not even heard it. And if you don't hear it, you can't ask God for it. So they say, no, John only told you about Jesus who is to come. He, he baptized you unto repentance, but he's pointing to Jesus who's coming with the promise of the Father, with the Holy Ghost. And he laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. And God commanded them, Peter commanded them, Paul commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, it's imperative that you have this power, the presence and the power of God in you. Man, I, 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 look, I was on that other side without the Holy Ghost. And man, I was just, and look, man, when, when Portia and her sister came over to the school to tell my brother Tyrone and I that we needed the Holy Ghost, man, I thought that girl was crazy. I thought it was witchcraft. And that boy, Tyrone, went and got filled with the Holy Ghost on me, baptized in Jesus' name. I got mad with him. But the day that I got baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, my hands looked new. That song was right. The sky looked new. I had joy 
unspeakable. I threw away my telephone book with my, with my girlfriends. I threw away my Columbia weed. Man, I was born again. I had power in me to do right. And that's the thing that the Holy Ghost brings. When you come to the fact, and I'm, I'm coming to my close, you all, who shall deliver me from this death? Lord, deliver me from me. God has sent the deliverer, the Holy Ghost. And, and Luke says in 3 and 11, I believe, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That fire is a cleansing agent. That fire represents Jesus himself. For Hebrew says that our God is a consuming fire. Man, when you get the Holy Ghost and fire in you, everything that's not like God, God burns it up. Every thought that's not like God burns it up. And I love this about the Holy Ghost. You can get as close to God as you want. All you need to do is go in prayer. Once you have the Holy Ghost, man, you close that door and you ask God to come into the room. God comes into the room. You begin to speak in a language that's heavenly language. You begin to feel the presence of God. He began to minister to your spirit, to your heart. And I wish y'all knew what I was talking about. Man, I, I, it's the best thing that I ever got because it's greater than a high. It's greater than a fix. It's greater than being popular. It's greater than being rich when you can connect with the God of the universe anytime that you want to. But here's the thing, you all. He is a gentleman. He ain't going to make you do nothing. He ain't going to make you come in and pray. He ain't going to make you read the word. And those of us who stop praying and stop reading the word, then in Galatians it tells you that your flesh is worn against your spirit. If you begin to sow to the flesh, uh, Galatians tell us that if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. It gives you the list of the corruptible things you're going to reap. You're going to fall into the works of the flesh. For he that you lend yourself to, he is that you become servants of. So if you lend yourself to the flesh, my brothers and sisters, then the works of the flesh is going to come in. Adultery, fornication, hatred, murder, immolation, seditions, all of these things. And the Bible says, look, I told you once and I shall tell you again. Those that do such things should not inherit the kingdom of God. My brothers and sisters, just because you have the Holy Ghost, it don't mean that you're going to go in. You got to follow and walk in and live in the spirit of God. And those of you who sow to the spirit reap life everlasting. In other words, you reap the fruit of the spirit. You become just like Jesus on this earth. You got love. You got joy. The joy of the Lord is the strength of your life. You got peace that surpasses all understanding. Things are falling down around you, but you still got that God, that Holy Ghost, that spiritual connection that holds you in place even while things are falling. And people are watching and saying, man, I would have shot myself, but you're still standing. You're still giving God the glory and the praise. They got temperance. Not only are they not in alcohol, but they know how to control their bodies. They know how to present themselves faultless before God. They know how to walk among people because they have that fruit. It ain't your fruit. It's when you yield to God and walk right with God and stay in prayer with God, he start giving you those fruit. And those fruit uh, bring glory to God. My brothers and my sisters, it ain't no time to be in a war in your members. It is not time to be in these works of the flesh. It's time, man, to look up for your redemption, draw it nigh. 
Can't you feel that this is rapture season? Can't you feel that the Lord is doing something different this time? Can't you feel that God is on his way back? My brothers and sisters, get the Holy Ghost. If you haven't gotten it, remember when Moses turned off to the mountain to see why that bush was burning, but it was not burned up. When he got near that bush, the Lord spoke out of that bush and said, Moses, take off your shoes for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. What made that ground holy since the whole earth is cursed? What made that particular ground holy? The Holy Ghost was in the bush. If you're going to be holy, you better have the Holy Ghost in your bush, your heart. That's the agent that's going to deliver you from you. I ain't finished, y'all, but I know time is getting away and I got to stop. But not until the next time, which would be next week, but the time after that week, we will be back if the Lord say so. In the meantime, you keep praying for me and keep asking the Lord to deliver you from you. God bless you guys. I love you. Bye-bye.